This is a good move. Why you dancing? Dancing is forbidden. Dancing is forbidden. Yoo-hoo, running crew, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and on this podcast, I am watching through and talking about every Aqua Teen episode, one episode at a time. And the episode we are watching through and talking about this week is Season 4, Episode 6, Party All the Time. Party All the Time making its Adult Swim debut on November 5th, 2006. In this episode, Andrew W.K. guest stars in this very special episode about tragedy, courage, and ultimately, redemption. Our guest stars in this episode are, of course, Andrew W.K. and Eugene Meerman, both making their Aqua Teen debuts. And, I mean, that little uh, synopsis I read for you, that's what it says on Adult Swim's site. Of course, in this episode, Frylock gets cancer, right? It's a very dramatic and serious episode. And I know that I saw this one around this time. I don't have, like, a specific recollection of seeing it, but I know for certain that in the summer of 2007, so about six months after it debuts, I remember joking around about it with friends at a battle of the bands I was doing. And we'll talk more about that battle of the bands later in the episode. It actually ties into our pop culture segment. But yeah, I knew I saw this one around this time. I remember thinking it was funny, particularly the juxtaposition between the Andrew WK Party Party song and the somber atmosphere of this episode with with Frylock having cancer. But this is a very divisive episode. I know a lot of people do not like this one because it is so different. And that is a trend we're seeing here throughout season four, but I don't want to say too much about it. We'll get into that in so much more. I want to say that we have uh, some never before heard info from Dave Willis and Matt Malero on this one. Dave's telling us his biggest regret about this episode. So before we could talk about that, you know, we've got some other stuff to talk about. First up, our Aqua Teen news this week, and we got a lot of it, right? So uh, buckle in. If you're already buckled in like you're driving, unbuckle really quickly and then buckle back in because we got a lot to go through. The most obvious thing, of course, is Aqua Teen Season 12 is here, and I already put an episode out talking about these first two episodes with Tom Cruise. It was a sold-out show at Royal Albert Hall. I couldn't believe it. Thank you to the BBC and CMT, Country Music Television, for making all of that happen. If you didn't hear the episode, go listen to it. So as of this podcast episode coming out, the third episode of Season 12 will have debuted As I record this, it's not out yet. I have not seen it. Adult Swim only sent me the first two. I don't think they're sending out the other three to press. So I can't talk about that third one here. My plan is after the rest of the three are out, so when the season is completely done, I'll go back and kind of uh, do a short episode talking about the next three at some point. And of course, we will deep dive through those like normal once we get to them in our Aqua Teen timeline. But of course, that'll be a few years down the line. But yeah, once all the episodes are out, I will be uh, doing a quick little summary here on the podcast feed just to hit you with my thoughts. I hope that you're liking these episodes. If you're listening to an Aqua Teen podcast, you're probably pretty on board. But I enjoyed them. Again, talked about them in that previous episode with Tommy Cruz. So listen to that. Of course, thank you to those who reached out who enjoyed that one. It meant a lot to me to know that you liked such a different kind of podcast episode. And if you didn't listen to that, I do want to say I announced there that I am in the fourth episode of season 12 called Get Lit Upon a Sit Upon. I am a grocery clerk in a scene with Frylock, so uh, keep your eyes out for when that scene pops up. It's uh, it's pretty pretty silly. I guess this is my last time I'll, I'll be talking to you uh, in this way before that episode premieres. I think it's coming out on December 10th. I'm pretty nervous to see it. Now, I don't know if you listened to the episode I put out. I actually put out an episode talking entirely about that whole process of doing that voice line on the show. And in that episode, I mentioned how I did, like, three different versions. I did, like, my normal voice. I did a a southern, like, hillbilly kind of accent. And then I did a Minnesotan accent for it. I don't know which one they picked. I don't know which take they picked. And I'm just ready to cringe like hell as soon as I see it. 
But on to more news since season 12 is rolling out. As you can imagine, Matt and Dave, they're making the rounds doing all sorts of, of little press junket videos on YouTube. So I'm going to put a link in the description uh, to YouTube. What I do is I sort by Matt. I, I type in Matt Malero in the search because his name is so goddamn unique, which I'm super thankful for. And then I search it by most recently uploaded. So that's how I've been finding all the interviews they've been doing on YouTube. And there's a handful of them. They're all pretty fun. I'd suggest checking them all out. I want to shout out Mike over at Geek Vibes Nation for giving me and this podcast a little shout out in his interview with the guys. I was not expecting it at all because I've never spoken to, to Mike before. Uh, but I, I was just watching this interview like I do all their interviews. And he brought up how uh, I was doing a voice on the episode, and, and they talk a little bit about that. So thanks, Mike, for that. Check out that interview. I'll put a link to that in the description. And in the description, you can also find a link to another interview I would certainly suggest because Tim Andrews of the Radio Labyrinth podcast, which is an Atlanta-based podcast, had Matt and Dave back on his show. I mean, Dave's done Radio Labyrinth a bunch of times, and I think Tim is one of the best guys who interviews them because he's friends with them. Right. And, and Tim's even going to be in one of the upcoming episodes, too. So I'll put a link to that in the description. Actually, it, you can see Matt Malero cooking and eating his food during the interview. So you can't get that kind of content anywhere else, folks. Check it out. So moving on here, there's another big bit of news that has happened. And that is that Aqua Teen did a Pop-Tarts commercial very recently. I think Rick and Morty did one, too, but... Uh, I don't care about that. I do care about this Aqua Teen one, though. I thought it was very funny, so I'll put a link to that in the description as well. I know there's a lot of links going on here, but there's been so much stuff coming out uh, involving Aqua Teen. And I'm excited that's finally out. Um, Matt told me about that a while ago, and it just sucks knowing things that I'm not supposed to talk about on the podcast. So I can say, I think for now, I don't know anything that you don't know about Aqua Teen because the Pop-Tarts commercial is out, and Matt and Dave have both spoken about how they're working on a film, and they're also working on a, a TV show. Now, of course, I don't think that these things are... Uh, sold yet or actually happening, but they are writing them and trying to go through that process to get these things made. So fingers crossed here. But that is our Aqua Teen news this week. There's a lot of it. How about we take a break from the present day? How about we jump over and see what the heck was going on November 5th, 2006, the week that Party All the Time premiered? Let's go check it out. Very nice, sing its way all the way to the top of the box office this week. We have Borat bringing in a cool $26 million, which Borat might say is a great success. And contributing to this great success is the fact that Borat actually debuted in less than 1,000 theaters, and it still went to the top of the box office, which, I mean, if you were around at this time, surely you'll remember the cultural impact that was Borat. It was everywhere. And I actually didn't see the film until years later. So, like, I remember seeing people doing the accent and seeing clips. And I'm like, oh, I don't really, you know, care for that very much. But eventually I did see the movie. I loved it. I loved the second one as well. And I just think that Sasha Baron Cohen is a genius. This guy is fucking brilliant. And Borat is a very, very funny film. Uh, I, I kind of want to go watch it again now after talking about it here. Some hot trivia for you is the fact that the police were called on Sasha Baron Cohen while playing Borat 92 times during the production of this film. Because if you're unfamiliar, I should probably tell you what this movie's about in case you somehow don't know. Basically, you have this character actor, Sasha Baron Cohen, playing the Borat character. And he's from Kazakhstan. He comes to the United States uh, to be like a reporter. And he's just super inappropriate, super crazy. And a lot of the stuff that they do is real. It's like real, you know, footage of him on the street and stuff. So yeah, over 90 times he got the cops called on him, which is hilarious. I guess the FBI assigned a team to Sasha Baron Cohen during the filming of the movie due to numerous reports of a Middle Eastern man traveling the Midwest in an ice cream truck. So, I mean, you just got to see this movie. It's great. And to exemplify this, there actually is some shared cast and crew between Aqua Teen and Borat. And first of all, we have Patton Oswalt, who you may know on Aqua Teen 
as the frat aliens from season two, episode 19, as well as reprising that role in season two, 24 is the last one. And who we will see again later this season in the season four episode, Ezekiel. So Patton actually wrote on this film. I don't think he starred in it. He just wrote on it. And then we also have Brandon Proctor, who did sound on this film, who also did sound on Aqua Teen Hunger Force, colon movie film for theaters, as well as Plantasm. And a funny connection here, I guess, with Brandon Proctor is that he also did sound on A Quiet Place, which, of course, the new episode, A Quiet Shake, spoofed. So those are just two of the similar cast and crew from Aqua Teen that were involved in Borat. Love the movie. So moving on here, let's give a sweet little listen to our top album this week. Debuting at the top number one spot of the U.S. Billboard 200 charts this week, we have Diddy with Press Play selling over 170,000 copies this week. And I should mention it's Diddy here, right? So I do need to clarify that when this was released, he was going under the name P. Diddy. Now, you thought Aqua Teen changed their name a lot. I think that they were inspired by P. Diddy here, or now just Diddy, because initially he was Puff Daddy, then he was P. Diddy, now he's Diddy. I think he went by, like, Puffy, uh, D. Pity, Puffy P. Daddy Diddy, uh, P. P. Diddy, Diddy Diddly Do, Diddy Diddly Do Do, and Puffy Diddy P. And I may have made some of those up, but you get the idea. This motherfucker was changing his name constantly. And for some reason, I was aware of that. Like, of course, I know who Diddy is. But listening through his music for this podcast, you know, this song in particular that I played, which was the single Come To Me featuring Nicole Scherzinger. I did not recognize this. I didn't recognize any of the other singles off this album. I didn't really recognize any of his songs. And you might be sitting there thinking, wow, a white guy from the Midwest doesn't know this hip-hop artist? That's crazy. But I mean, it's fucking Diddy. Like, I was like, how do I not recognize any of this shit? <laughs> so it's very crazy. But this record, I don't think is that loved. For example, on RateYourMusic.com, it has a 1.94 out of 5 out of 336 user ratings, uh, which is one of his lowest on there. I mean, this record only sits in this spot for one week. So Diddy was a big name. I think the hype of him being back and this single, which did well, sold a lot for the record. But then the rest of the record like wasn't that good. So I think that's kind of the situation here. I think, uh, you know, P. Diddy or Diddy, whatever the fuck he goes by now, I think he's doing just fine. But similar to how Aqua Teen went on to change its name a bunch of times, uh, I assume inspired by Diddy here. Uh, it seems like Diddy was inspired by Aqua Teen because for the music video for the single I just played, uh, the phone portrayed prominently at the beginning of the video is a Nokia 8800, which was not readily available at the time of the video shooting. So they used this video to promote a cell phone. I'd say a little similarly to how Aqua Teen did with Season 4, Episode 2, Boost Mobile, a year previous. Moving on to our top single this week, it's the same as it was for Hand Banana, which was Moneymaker by Ludacris featuring Pharrell. So let's jump in and listen to our top alternative track this week. And I must warn you, you're going to want to put on some eyeliner here. So I know you're like, God damn it, Ronnie. I'm driving. I'm strapped in. And now I got to put eyeliner on. Yes, you do. Our top alternative track this week is Welcome to the Black Parade by My Chemical Romance from the album The Black Parade. And I remember when this video came out, I caught it on MTV, I think before going to school. 
My Chemical Romance was a band that I really loved at this time. I've said a few times on the podcast how they were the first band, uh, their, their second record, their previous record, Three Tears for Sweet Revenge. That was the first CD I ever put on my iPod when I first got it. And I was a huge My Chemical Romance fan. And then this came out. And I liked the video. The video is pretty cool. They're like a gothic marching band kind of thing, which I should mention Marilyn Manson kind of did a few years previously. But I liked the video, but truth be told, I wasn't crazy about this song. I wasn't crazy about this album. And I think kind of fueling that was the fact that they really hit the mainstream with this record. And so suddenly I was seeing preppy kids from school like, oh, I like My Chemical Romance now. It's like, well, motherfucker, I was liking them two years ago and I didn't see you anywhere to be found. Now, the funny thing here is that I only knew about this band because I watched MTV, right? They were already pretty popular by the time that I was into them. It's not like I found them on the underground. They're a New Jersey band, so it's not like I was like seeing them in some New Jersey club when they first put out their first record or something. I got into them after they were already pretty popular, and then they really blew up. But that was a big moment for me in my life, where it was like the first time I was dealing with that, when you like something before it's like hugely popular and then it gets hugely popular. So I didn't quite know how to navigate that. Now I wasn't like talking shit to anybody or anything like that. A part of me thought it was cool that people were into this band that I liked, but, but yeah, I remember being disappointed by this record simply because if they went in more of like a normal rock kind of queen direction, as opposed to like, they were more emo y on their first two records, but I mean, it paid off, right? This was their biggest hit. And another song on the record, The Black Parade, was a song called Teenagers. And I actually performed that with some friends at a battle of the bands, the one that I mentioned previously in the episode where we were joking around about this episode of Aqua Teen Party all the time. Uh, I played the song Teenagers there, and it wasn't my choice. Like, I would have rather have played a different My Chemical Romance song, but that song is very easy to play. We were all like 13 years old at the time, so none of us really knew how to play our instruments that well. So I think like that was a good song for us to try and tackle. So if you are on the podcast Instagram, that is at Aqua Teen Pod, link in the description here. Uh, I'll put up some pictures <laughs> from that Battle of the Bands. I have the video. I have us playing Teenagers by My Chemical Romance, but I don't know if it's <laughs> I don't know if it's worth sharing. But yeah, this record, I mean. I heard it a lot at this time and, and in 2007, so even though it's not really my thing still, I do like it. I, I think it's a well-done record, but it's not my thing, but it really brings me back to this time whenever I hear it, so I appreciate it for that. And before I head out of this My Chemical Romance Welcome to the Black Parade talk, I should play the intro of the song for you because you might not have recognized uh, that verse and chorus, but you'll probably recognize the intro. When I was a young boy my father took me into the city to see a marching band. He said, You're probably like, oh, it's the marching band song, the little boy marching band song. I know that one. See, I told you you'd know it. So moving on to our video games here, what was coming out this past week that Party All the Time debuted? Well, on October 30th, we have Pokemon Ranger coming to North America on the Nintendo DS. So this was a spin-off Pokemon game. It wasn't like the normal ones where you start off, you get your starter Pokemon, you train them up, you catch other ones, you fight gyms, fight the Elite Four, beat the game. That's not what these were like. They were very different. They were a bit like this was this game particularly was a bit more story heavy, I think. And the mechanics were way different. And notably by that was on the Nintendo DS, if you don't know, the Nintendo DS had two screens and the bottom screen was a touch screen that you used a stylus with. Well, I think on this game... So one of the mechanics was like pressing the stylus on the touchscreen and then sp making circles very fast around the Pokemon that you were trying to like catch or something like that. And I just know a lot of people destroyed their Nintendo DS screens because <laughs> they're kids, right? You're giving this to kids like here, spin really fast. And they're probably pressing way too goddamn hard, just shredding this thing up. So rest in peace, all the Nintendo DSs due to Pokemon Ranger. Moving on, we have Grand Theft Auto Vice City Stories coming to the PSP. So the reception here was great, right? It's a GTA game. You can't really go wrong with those. But on the inverse here, we have Dave Mira BMX Challenge coming to the PSP, and that game got dog shit reviews, which I thought was really funny. I remember as a kid playing one of the Dave Mira BMX games. That's like... um. It's like the Tony Hawk skateboard games, but you're riding a bike around instead. I played one of them on my friend's computer like years before this, but I never really played any other ones. 
Uh, let me look and see if they even still make these. Okay, so no, this is actually the last Dave Mira BMX game, and it seems like for good reason. They actually, they made one in 2000, 2001, 2002, and then they fell off until now in 2006, and this was the last one, and it did very poorly. The other ones never really did that great, but they were okay, but I guess this one was just bad. So those are three games I want to talk about, just to mention a few others. We had Neverwinter Nights 2 coming to Windows. We had Final Fantasy 12 coming to the United States on PS2. And we had Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends coming to the Game Boy Advance this past week. So those are some of our video games. Look, it's November 5th, 2006. You're a real underground motherfucker, all right? Because you saw Borat in one of its 1,000 theaters that it was released in. And you're following that new My Chemical Romance album that just came out. I mean, you you knew about it before it was even on MTV. You just followed the band and knew about it. And also, you're not one of those sheeple who plays normal Pokemon games. No, you're playing the spinoff here, Pokemon Ranger, and nobody can touch your street cred. And to really solidify this fact of how goddamn cool you are, of course you're watching Adult Swim. What the fuck else would you be watching at this time? It's the coolest thing on TV, and you're about to see some cool shows coming on tonight. First up at 10 p.m., we have Futurama with Where the Bugalo Roam. And I remember that episode. It's a very sweet episode. You have Amy, which is one of like the side characters, but it's kind of focused on her and her, her lover, Kip. Uh, I don't know if they're together at this point or, or what, but I remember this episode because they go to, to Amy's parents' ranch, and all this crazy stuff happens, but in typical Futurama fashion, there's some very sweet moments, so I really like that episode. Of course, not a new episode, because that episode came out years ago. Like, Futurama wasn't making new stuff at this point, I don't think. At 10.30 p.m., the reason we are gathered here today, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, party all the time, you know it's a new episode. And tag teaming in after that episode, at 10.45, we have another Aqua Teen episode, my favorite Aqua Teen episode, Kidney Car. Can't go wrong with some Kidney Car here. A nice back-to-back -back of this kind of anti-humor, depressing episode of Aqua Teen with what I think is one of the funniest Aqua Teen episodes. So they balance us out there. At 11 p.m., we have Family Guy with Stewie Loves Lois. This being a new Adult Swim episode, although it is not a new episode in itself, it debuted a little over two months ago on Fox. But this episode's very funny because you have Lois basically saving Stewie's uh, teddy bear Rupert. And normally Stewie throughout Family Guy, at least these early episodes, he hates Lois. Like his whole thing is he wants to destroy her. But in that moment, she saves his bear and then he like loves her and it becomes overwhelming for Lois. Like she gets so sick of Stewie always wanting attention from her. And there's just that great scene where, where Stewie's just like, mom, mommy, mom, mom. This goes on for like 45 seconds he's just mom mommy mom and she's ignoring him and then she finally goes what and then he just goes hi and then runs away laughing <laughs> i thought that was the funniest shit when i was a kid and i still do my wife and i saw that one like a month ago or something it's so good so after that at 11 30 p.m we have another new episode robot chicken lust for puppets 11.45 p.m., we have Metalocalypse with Blues Clock, where the boys gotta learn how to play the blues. Of course, they're a metal band, so it goes about as funny as you'd expect. At midnight, we have Squidbillies with Asses to Ashes, Sluts to Dust. That is a new episode. I love the uh, Squidbilly titles on these. They're always really funny. 12.15 a.m., we have Moral Oral with the Best Christmas Ever. This is not a new episode. This was the first episode of Moral Oral to debut. However, it was actually written as the last episode of that first Moral Oral season. But they're playing it here. Uh, again, not a new episode. At 12.30 a.m., though, we're back up with the new episodes with Frisky Dingo. The episode is XPO. 12.45 a.m., 12 Ounce Mouse with Meat Warrior. Another new episode. And then after this, we do not have new episodes. 1 a.m. gives us the Venture Bros with Love Beats. Uh, bites? I'm not sure how to... That's probably how they want you to pronounce it, but it's B-H-E-I-T-S. And then 1.30 a.m., Stroker and Hoop with I Saw Stroker Killing Santa, a.k.a. A Cold Dead White Christmas. So that is our Adult Swim lineup this night. And I do want to mention that after this night, going into Monday... 
Aqua Teen is actually back on weekdays now. So Aqua Teen was not showing on weekdays. It was only on Sundays, except for maybe like special occasions. But now, like the next Monday night, we have two Aqua Teen episodes being season one, episode one's Rabot and season one, episode two's Escape from Leprechopolis. So they're just starting playing Aqua Teen from the beginning, basically, on weeknights now on Adult Swim after the fifth here. So that's our Adult Swim lineup. That's our pop culture covered. Let's jump in and just have a great time with this episode. We're going to party, party, party. It's going to be fun. Let's go check it out. Check it out. Check it out, y'all. Check it out. Check it out. By the way, that was a joke. This is a very depressing episode of Aqua Teen. But you know what's not depressing? The fact that there are listeners of this podcast who like it enough to support it so that I can keep doing it. It's one of the little the little lights of my life seeing these emails roll in with a new moon master signing up over at patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden and not only do you get a shout out here on the show not only do you get my undying love not only do you get to feel all warm and fuzzy and horny inside for supporting this show but if you sign up at the five dollar and up level you also get exclusive episodes that i put out every month just for those who support the podcast as a way to say, hey, thanks. We've got two new signups I want to shout out this week. First up, we have PJ Van Pelt signing up at the birthday dollar, one dollar tier. PJ, thank you so much. Worth mentioning that PJ is in the band Glad to Be Dead, who I've shouted out many times on this show because they use lots of Aqua Teen references in their music. But PJ is not the only one signing up. Signing up at the duffel bag of cash $5 tier, we have Christian G. And Christian is a real deal supporter. I mean, he's been listening since 2021 when I started this podcast. So it means a lot when these longtime listeners decide to sign up and, and help this thing keep going in this way. Regarding Christian's uh, origin story with Aqua Teen, Christian says... I think I was six when I first came across the Aqua Teens, and I believe it was the old Drippy episode. I was just enjoying the first time seeing talking fast food characters. It was then that I realized that cartoons were also for adults when my parents came in and said I can't watch this show, which got me confused and upset because I liked what I saw. I remember being allowed to watch only one episode with my dad, which was The Shaving. And I constantly kept drawing the characters, which influenced them to buy me a poster and lunchbox when I was like eight. Then binging the show at like 12 every time it showed on Adult Swim, and never stopped watching since. This show was the core to my debut as the animator I am today. Regarding Christian's favorite episode of Aqua Teen, it is Season 2, Episode 22's The. Or The The. (laughs) Christian says, I know it's kind of mean-spirited because of Frylock, but the whole situation and plot is funny and messed up. So Christian... It's so cool the way that your parents, like, at first they didn't let you watch Aqua Teen, and then they kind of supported you in your love of it. Love to see it. And it looks like you inherited your parents' supporting nature, because now you're supporting this podcast. Thanks, Christian. Coming up next, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Party All the Time debuting on Adult Swim on November 5th, 2006, with a TV 14L rating for Strong Course Language. No disagreements here, I guess it makes sense, you know, for a, for a season 4 Aqua Teen episode. As for our voice actors here, of course, we have the usual Dana Snyder, Carrie Means, and Dave Willis as Master Shake, Frylock, and then Meatwad and Carl, respectively. But we also have Andrew WK here performing a song. I don't think he has any speaking roles, but we do see, his, uh, we do see him in cartoon form in the episode performing a song. And then we have Eugene Meerman playing a doctor in the episode. So, of course, we'll get to those guys and discuss them more once they show up in the episode. But you know who else is showing up in this episode? We have Aqua Teen co-creator Matt Malero showing up in live action form as a guitar instructor who we will see very early on in this one and is one of my favorite jokes in all of Aqua Teen. So excited to get to that. On the editing on this one, we have Jay Wade Edwards on the ones and twos. Jay is Aqua Teen's first ever editor, and I'm excited to see what he does on this one, this more uh, dramatic episode of the show. So without further ado, what do you say we jump in to party all the time here? Of course, we don't have a cold open because it's season four. We go right into the intro, and then after that, we get an establishing shot of the Aqua Teen's house. We zoom in. 
And then we cut in on the Aqua Teens TV so we could see what they're watching, which is Matt Malero on the screen here, dressed up in a crazy outfit. I'll describe the visuals of this scene after the clip. But the important part is, is that he's a guitar instructor and he is really just doing this crazy kind of shredding stuff. And the joke is eventually he'll be like, now you try. And then he'll point at like the screen and then some tabs will pop up, which is like where you're supposed to put your fingers. And it's going to zoom by super fast, like unrealistically fast (laughs) to where nobody would be able to play this, right? This is a horrible instructional uh, cassette tape here. And worth mentioning that these tapes were popular uh, back before the internet was as robust as it is now, right? Because these days you could just go on YouTube or you could just, you know, look up the tabs yourself or whatever. But this was a thing where you would buy these cassettes or later DVDs and they would show you how to play either songs or just like guitar lessons and things like that. And that's what Shake is trying to do because we'll then cut from the TV and see that Shake is here with with his guitar. This is actually the guitar that we first saw in Season 1, Episode 4's Mayhem of the Moon Knights that Dr. Weird was playing. So we've seen this guitar a few times throughout Aqua Teen. And we have the Weird Amps as well, which are modeled after uh, Marshall Amps uh, in the background. And then Meatwad's there kind of manning the VHS player because Shake's going to be instructing Meatwad no, go back, go back. Like, I, I missed a part. And again, the joke is that there's no way that a beginner could ever possibly play this. <laughs> yeah, look at him whip. His fingers go from A to China, man. It's like the skeletal boardwalk across the ocean. <sighs> now you try. <laughs> Whoa, hold on, I gotta get plugged in. Hey, where's the plug-in part? <laughs> Back from the beginning, please. Yeah, I you to try. <laughs> now, rewind again. Yeah, I you to try. <laughs> Damn it! I'm so close! Take it back! One more time! <laughs> Well, you missed the first half of the first note. <laughs> and then Matt comes in. You're a dick. Like, he didn't say that before. I love that they included that. I guess somehow Meatwad re- rewound to this unheard part. But I absolutely love this clip because not only is it unrealistic that a beginner could play this, and then the tabs are absolutely flying by. But, like, if you are a musician who has ever tried to play along to recorded music, you've probably encountered something similar to this, of of not starting it at the right part or whatever. And Shake's like, you, you cut off the first half of the first note. Like, it's just so arbitrary. But we do get some tablature flying across the screen. I did want to actually, like, play that for you, but the resolution is so small, I can't really make out what the notes are, unfortunately. So I would have loved to have seen what they threw in there. Obviously, it's not actually what Matt is playing. Matt is just going bonkers and just playing random shit, but a bit of a bummer, yeah, that the show is is still too low resolution for me to pick out these small details. And this is the last season where that will be the case, because going into season five, that season is in HD. But regardless, we have a lot of stuff to go over here. So... We see Matt Malero. He is wearing a long black wig, like 80s hair, kind of rocker guy. Uh, He's wearing like a neon fishnet. It's a green neon fishnet uh, shirt and like kind of like outfit. He's wearing leather chaps. He uh, has sunglasses on even though he's inside. And he is holding his Gibson Les Paul gold top. And we talked about this back in the season three, episode 13, Space Gate World coverage. Because this is supposed to kind of be the guitar that he is holding in that episode. So I'm not going to rehash the history with this guitar. But in this video, it's funny because he has like bandanas hanging off of it. And at at one point, we see he has a bunch of capos on the guitar. Which is funny because the way that he has them on the guitar, I think there's even one on the headstock too, which wouldn't do anything. But the way he has these, you only need one capo in this situation. So having more of them is just funny and it's there just to be silly. It's kind of like a musician joke, I guess, because the other three aren't accomplishing anything. As for the background here, first of all, there's a motorcycle in the room that Matt's sitting on. It's like so over the top rockery, so so silly. Um, There are a bunch of Marshall amps in the background, which are the amps that the... uh, amp that Shake is playing on is modeled after. I do find it interesting 
that Shake's amp says weird, I assume because they weren't allowed to use Marshall's like company logo in the episode. But then when we see these actual Marshall amps, they do have the logo on it. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, I always loved this joke. And I reached out to Matt about this because I was just wondering if he remembered anything about the filming of this. And I should mention on the DVD that this episode is included on, the Volume 5 DVD, we get like the full clip of them doing this, like a full recording. So there's way more than is shown in the episode. So link in the description here if you would like to see that full special feature. It's up on YouTube. So yeah, I reached out to Matt about this shoot and asked him if he had any memories of it. And he had a whole heck of a lot. So Matt said, That was a fun shoot. We shot in the live room at Blue Tube Studios. Michael Kohler, our sound mixer, owned that place. That was the same live room we recorded Mastodon for the first movie in. Michael is also a guitar fanatic, so those are his amps behind me. He also owns the motorcycle I'm sitting on. So, yeah, we learned that they filmed this at, at Blue Tube Studios, which that's where the, you know, Michael Kohler is one of the sound guys for Aqua Teen, So he does a lot of uh, sound work on the show, particularly, too, with like the music for the show. It'd be Michael Kohler or uh, Sean Coleman typically doing the songs, like helping Matt and Dave with the songs for the show. So Matt goes on to say, back up two days before, dot, dot, dot. So I love that Matt's email here has a bit of a time jump, <laughs> which is definitely, uh, you know, something that you might even expect to see in his, uh, his television shows and films. But uh, so Matt says, back up two days before, Vishal Roney, our production manager, went with me to a costume store and a Western boot store to buy the wig, leather chaps, fishnet shirt thing, and the sunglasses. I love it when Adult Swim buys me stuff. The bandanas, I have no idea where they came from, and I wanted a capo on every fret up to the 12th fret, but we only had four to work with. So yeah, at a certain point, we see that the guitar has four capos on it, and this is super funny, and it's even funnier to me that they wanted to have 12 capos on the guitar, because again, like I said earlier, having more than one in this way does not accomplish anything, so it's just absurdity. The last thing Matt has to say about this is, by the way, I still own the leather chaps. I wore them for the Sean Kemp shoot over Silver Pants when we filmed the opening for Plantasm. Chaps always make people around you worried, but if you're covered up, you own the place. So, a life lesson from Matt Malero here. The last thing I want to say about this whole guitar situation is that I love whenever Shake is holding this guitar, because first of all, it's huge, but secondly, I like the way that the strap is all wrapped around his straw. I think that's really funny. So... To get back into our scene here, there was another component to the scene that I didn't mention, and that was that we saw Frylock working on a time machine. And visually, it's kind of like a chrome pod, and then it says time machine on the top in neon. This time machine will show up throughout the show, uh, so it's possible you've seen it in other episodes too. But we see Frylock kind of working on it over there, and interestingly, there is some sort of growth on his face that will be addressed in our next clip because uh, Shake is going to keep trying to play along with this VHS and Frylock, he's going to be annoyed with it. Your dick. <laughs> yeah! This is how you do it! <laughs> Can you all keep it down, please? Shut up and listen to the wail of my banshee fingers! <laughs> <laughs> Why are you melted? A time machine. That's dumb. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, Mr. Smarty Pants, have you ever gone back in time? I've farted my way out of an elevator. That's not the same thing. <laughs> What's that thing on your face? Huh? Oh, probably a zit or something. Well, look, I'm no doctor, but that right there looks like, uh, you know, melanoma. Hmm. <clears throat> well, it does. Beef baloney. Will you get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> Me? What? He was right. He's like melanoma. Beef baloney. <laughs> So if you're unaware, melanoma is skin cancer. And in that last clip, I mean, we really got a taste of what the rest of this episode kind of has to offer, which is long kind of s stretches of silence, not a whole ton of dialogue packed into things. As always, I love any sort of guitar background uh, noise that they have. I guess that's probably just Matt messing around on guitar for that. I do want to shout out the visuals because we have Frylock making this time machine. Again, it looks to be chrome. And because of that, it's reflective. So when Meatwad points out Frylock's, uh, the thing on his face, 
he looks in his reflection into the time machine, which I think is really cool and is another nod to the fact that this show visually is a bit more advanced than it was when it started because you wouldn't see something like this in season one. Actually, though, speaking of season one, I went to season one, episode nine's MCP pants because that episode as well has Shake trying to play guitar and trying to write a, a song on his guitar. And this is the same asset, I'm guessing. It's just a higher... A resolution version of it of this guitar but in mcp pants the guitar is noticeably uh, brighter red than it is here in party all the time it's a little bit more muted of a red I'm not sure why that's the case but uh, i love it because when i go back and look at mcp pants that guitar is so pixelated on shake but that is not the case here in season four of the show when they're working with higher definition assets. Even though, again, the show is still in 480p, the assets they are using are at least higher resolution. But we're not the only ones looking at this guitar here. Cutting back into our scene, we're going to have Meatwad go over to Shake and take the guitar out of his hands because Shake's trying to blame the guitar for the reason that he can't play. But Meatwad will prove it's not the guitar. Damn it! I'm hitting the notes! It, you know, it's a guitar. <laughs> no, no, this action is good. I think the problem is your hands. <laughs> you got some baby hands. Meatwad does have a point here now. I mean, Shake can't help his hands, but I don't think these hands are very conducive to playing guitar. <laughs> Although it's funny because, you know, Meatwad, he's just got a little... Uh, uh, for lack of a much better term, wad of meat for a hand, <laughs> and he's able to shred like that, so I don't know what the discrepancy is. Regardless, Shake is going to try and remedy his baby hands by getting them bigger, and the best way that he could go about doing that is sticking his hands in a bee's nest. So we're going to cut outside, we are in Carl's backyard, and Shake has a ladder going up to a tree. He's wearing this kind of like, it looks like a children's toy, but it's it's some sort of like walkie-talkie system he has on his ear, where he's talking to Meatwad. We will see this later in the show, like I know there's other episodes that feature this, although I think this is the first time that we're seeing it. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, he has on this little walkie-talkie thing, he's talking with Meatwad, they're trying to... uh get his hands stung up, and it goes about as well as you'd expect. This is totally gonna work. Okay, I'm inside and I got the doors and windows closed. Go on and do it. Roger that. <laughs> How's that feel? Oh, I can feel it getting bigger. They look like they're getting you in the eyeballs, too. Well, I know that. If I rip any solos with my eyeballs, I'm gonna need the bees. Let him do enlarge them. <laughs> you know, otherwise I get on stage looking like a big asshole, and I am not that. <laughs> 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 so that's Shake falling off the ladder. And yeah, we have Meatwad inside. He's in Frylock's room, kind of looking at the window with binoculars on the walkie-talkie. The background we have here, like I said, it is Carl's backyard, and we see the Aqua Teen's backyard, and then their neighbor uh, to, to their left, if you're looking from the backyard, we see them as well. It's a very far out shot, and what's interesting to me is that we could see on the Aqua Teen's house, written on the side, kind of by where Frylock's window is, it says, leave, freaks, like spray painted on there. And I can't really find that anywhere else in any other shots. Certainly not normal close shots of Carl's backyard when we see the Aqua Teen's house. So I don't know definitively if this is the first time we're seeing that. I don't know if we've seen this far shot in the show before or not. I can't quite recall. But yeah, you will see it. It's spray painted there. It does say, leave, freaks. A fun discrepancy with that, too, is that from the outside, it looks like Frylock has his shades drawn, but then when we see Meatwad, like when we get a shot of him looking out the window, there are no shades on the window. So Shake, he put his hands in the nest, you know, and then he got all stung up and he passes out, falls off the ladder and everything. This not being the first time that we see Shake getting stung by bees, for example, off the top of my head, we have season three, episode five's E-Dork, because remember, in that episode, Shake can't move, so Meatwad just releases some bees around him and he just has to stand there getting stung. But like I said, Shake passed out, so in our next clip now, Shake is going to be coming to, and the first thing he sees is Frylock, who's kind of waking him up, and we see that the growth on Frylock's face looks a little bit different now, and then we'll see Shake, who's just covered in bee sting welts all over the place, on his eyeballs, everywhere, he's all puffed up, he's all messed up. 
And that actually reminds me of another instance where we have bees in Aqua Teen and Shake gets really stung up. And that is in Season 1, Episode 14's Dumber Days. In that one, remember, uh, Meatwad lost his brain, so Shake hands him a bee's nest. Like, yeah, this is your brain. Put it in your head. But then Carl starts ringing the doorbell, and the bees freak out and attack Shake. He gets stung up as well, although not nearly as bad as in this scene. Shake. Shake. Are you all right? I've never been better. (laughs) Whoa. What's up with that face, man? Nothing. What do you mean? You tried to cover it up with makeup like a girl. Can you tell? Really? Yeah, you look like... No, I get that thing checked out. Every year I get me a physical. Oh, really? And who's your doctor? Dr. John. Olivia Newton John. <laughs> I got a physical, physical. <laughs> on your face, boy. On your face. <laughs> Please. Look, he's just playing around. But I'm serious. <laughs> You will soon be paying to see me in a concert. (laughs) So Shake picks the guitar up. He's ready to rock and roll. And yeah, so Frylock, the reason his his growth looked different was he tried to put some foundation on it, I guess, to cover it up. And this is a very rare instance of where Meatwad is being the logical one here because he's like, I think you should get that checked out. He's I think this is like the second time he said it. And Frylock is kind of refusing to because even though Frylock is the logical character in the show, I think sometimes when it comes to our own well-being and our own lives, like we might not be as logical about these things. I I assume Frylock is in a bit of denial. So having to go to the doctor to get this checked out would be actually confronting the problem, which he doesn't quite want to do. I also like (laughs) Meatwad and his Olivia Newton-John reference. He is specifically referencing her song, Physical, which you might know as Let's Get Physical. You know who probably should also go to the doctor would be Master Shake, because to his welts, like, one of his hands is way bigger than the other one. But again, I guess he's feeling okay, because he popped right back up, and he grabbed that guitar, was ready to go. But going into our next scene here, Frylock is taking Meatwad's advice. We see Frylock at a doctor's office, this being our first time seeing this asset on the show. Although, I mean, they keep using this over and over again. For example, to the episodes we've covered on the podcast, we recently did the 2022 Aquadonk side piece, Hand Bananas Demise. And in that one, Carl goes to the vet. That is the same exact background. So they made this background in 2006, and they used it most recently in 2022. So you love to see it. Frylock, he's getting checked out by the doctor. The doctor is not named here. He is played by Eugene Meerman. Uh, It's worth mentioning that in 2015, Dave Willis tweeted out basically saying that this, this doctor's name was Gene Belcher, which is the name of the character that Eugene Meerman plays on Bob's Burgers. So, of course, Bob's Burgers did not exist at this point. There's no way that this character could have actually been named Gene Belcher. Dave was just making a joke, but it's worth mentioning. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I don't like the look of this at all. So it's not an ingrown hair? Oh, no, no. It's irregular, which means some sort of some damage, probably. Really? We'll biopsy it and have some results for you within the week. I mean, it's probably nothing, right? Well, let's, uh, let's, let's hope not. A quick scene there with Eugene playing that doctor, and he will pop back up again in this episode, and he will reprise his role as this character throughout the series, too. He shows back up playing this doctor as well. But to the doctor's look, he looks just really similar to Eugene Meerman, if you know what he looks like. Uh, But I was actually really surprised to see here how early in Eugene's career this role was, or at least his, like, film and television career. Because he was a stand-up comedian uh, before this, but this was his third role ever. Before this, he was on a show called Third Watch. He was on an episode of that. And then what we would be familiar with was he was on two episodes of Home Movies, which, of course, got picked back up by Adult Swim, who produced more episodes of it. So he was in two episodes of Home Movies. I actually brought this up to Dave because I was like, oh, how'd you get hooked up with Eugene? And Dave said, I always loved Eugene's stand-up. Eugene was probably in our orbit because of Lauren Bouchard, who produced Home Movies. So that's what Dave had to say. But after this episode of Aqua Teen, Eugene would go on to be on other Adult Swim shows like Lucy, the Daughter of the Devil. He's in 10 episodes of that show. He's in 27 episodes of Delocated, which is an amazing show. He also, of course, goes on to do Bob's Burgers, and he shows up in Archer and an episode of The Simpsons. 
But Eugene is very funny. I like his stand-up as well. But they're not really using him in a funny way here because this is not a particularly funny episode of the show, which we will continue to discuss as it goes on here. Uh, So even though Eugene is a very funny guy, he doesn't get to be that funny here. This episode, of course, though, is not without its moments of levity, particularly from uh, Shake and Meatwad. And we're going to see a little bit of that here where we're going to go to the waiting room where they are having a magazine fight while they are waiting for Frylock. Magazine war! Better homes and gardens <laughs> one! Four! Eat my red book! Better homes and gardens two! Hey, there he is! That's a mouse! This guy's got the biggest genital warts I've Shake. ever seen in my life! <laughs> Will you stop it, Shake? I am not in the mood for this, okay? So, a big moment of silence there, and that's something that we get a lot throughout this episode. Different from the Spaced Ghost silences, of course, on the Patreon last month, we just went over another Space Ghost episode where they would purposely add in this silence to be awkward and to be weird. But here the silence is not. It's just kind of sad. It's it's a, a bit of a somber silence. And we'll continue to see that throughout this episode. And I've chosen to keep those moments in the podcast. Normally, I would cut stuff like that out and just tell you what happened. But I think those are important to tell this story because we had Meatwad and Shake throwing magazines. Those magazines, I should mention, being a lot of the ones that we saw in Season 1, Episode 6's Spaced Conflict from Beyond Pluto, when Shake is locked in the Plutonian's pod thing. Uh, He's reading those magazines. It's a lot of those same covers that we see being thrown around. And I do want to say the uh, doctor's office there... And the uh, waiting room were pretty nondescript, like just imagine any old doctor's office and waiting room. But uh, notably in the waiting room, we saw a couple people. We saw a man and a woman sitting there, which is not typical of Aqua Teen whatsoever to see uh, human background characters like that. But again, we have uh, Shake and Meatwad in the waiting room throwing stuff. And then Frylock's just like, you know, let's go. And then we have Shake just standing there. For a solid six seconds, he just kind of stands there, not really knowing what to do, because they are kind of being faced with this serious situation of of Frylock being sick, and he's in a bad mood because of that, too. We cut back to the Aqua Teen's house now, though, and Frylock is in a bit better of a mood because he's working on his time machine, and he, he finishes it. He gets it going, evidently. He's excited about that, but Meatwad and Shake aren't as interested. In fact, there's a little scorpion in their house, and they're debating who should eat it, and ultimately, Shake takes the first plunge. That's it. Now, who wants to make history and go back in time? Yeah, we're busy. (laughs) You eat it. You can meet President Lincoln. Lincoln is dead. (laughs) All right, deal. Wait a minute. How you gonna eat it after I eat it? Look, you eat it, then I go back in time to before the time when you eat it, then I eat it. (laughs) Okay. That's Shake throwing it down here. So I like the callback to the outro of the show because Frylock says you could meet President Lincoln, if you'll recall, the end of every Aqua Teen episode, at least through these first handful of seasons, is that we get that slide where they're visiting President Lincoln. So I like that little uh, throwback there, also kind of a callback to the movie, which had yet to come out at this point, because in the film, they have a bit of a, a full reimagining of the outro sequence at the beginning of that of that movie. But speaking of Time Machine, I'm brought to... I, I can't remember which episode it was. I know it was a season three episode where uh, I think Dave said like, oh, if we ever have a time machine in an episode, it's because we ran out of ideas. I think it was season three. It might have been season two. But I remember hearing that in a commentary. And of course, here we have a time machine, although uh, spoilers, they don't ever end up actually using it. It's just kind of like an interesting plot device. Uh, but they don't use the time machine here, although they, they had, I think they used one in the movie, right? <laughs> Which is funny that, that uh, I think it was Dave is on record as having said that in a commentary. And of course, in, the, in future episodes, I know there's one where they use the time machine as well. But I love it as a conversation piece here where Meatwad uses that to get Shake to eat the scorpion. Because he's like, all right, you eat it, then we'll go back in time, and then I'll eat it. That way we both could have eaten this one singular scorpion 
So this is one of those episodes where Meatwad is pretty smart. Like, not only was he giving good advice to Frylock to go see a doctor, but he's also outsmarting Shake in all of these different ways throughout this episode. The phone is going to ring now. Frylock's going to answer it. It's his doctor. And then, so we have Frylock in the foreground of the shot. And then in the background, we have Shake kind of flailing around because he ate a scorpion. And now he's dying. His face is turning purple. Hello? Oh, oh, hey, Doc. Really? <laughs> okay. It can be cut out, right? Additional treatment? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, chemotherapy, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, what did the doctor say? He says I have cancer. Well, did you... Did you tell him that you don't? Me what? <laughs> I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. What's, uh, what's wrong with him? He's dead. Dumbass ate a scorpion. Okay, so that transition you heard, basically what happens is it zooms in on a family photo of Frylock, Shake, and Meatwad. It's really cute. It's a very sweet photo. They're all kind of hugging in Carl's pool, like taking a nice photo together. And I want to mention here, in the background, you can see, again, the Leave Freaks written on their house, which is, uh, again, I don't want to say it's never been there before this episode. I feel like it has. I just don't know where. But certainly uh, in 99% of other episodes, it's not there. So funny to see it there again. But you know what also is normally not in an episode of Aqua Teen, and that is this photo of Frylock, Master Shake, and Meatwad in the pool. And it's an interesting choice from Jay to have that there because they use this basically to transition to our next scene, which is a bit of a time cut. Because we zoom in, we see, you know, Frylock is in that photograph smiling, looking like normal, looking healthy. And then we cut now, we're going to, it's like, it, it's a fade transition into the doctor's office again and Frylock is there and this time he looks noticeably sick he doesn't have as many fries in his box and I mean you could just tell he is very ill in this next scene so when will you find out about the blood test uh won't be for another week but uh you're looking good you're, you're looking good yeah yeah <laughs> thanks stay strong okay we'll see you on Tuesday the doctor leaves, and then we get a heartfelt kind of moment. It, it, there's no dialogue here, but I'm still going to play it, just because, again, I think it's important for this story of Frylock. He's going to float over to a mirror and kind of, like, mess around with his fries, like, trying to get them to look good. Because at this point, we assume he's on chemo, and that's why his fries are falling out. Uh, so he's trying to, you know, get, get his fries in order, and then he's going to put a hat on and leave the room. So that's the music. This is a fun episode, right? This is really this is really enjoyable, huh? This is exactly the kind of content that I wanted to talk about uh, when starting an Aqua Teen Hunger Force podcast. Something I want to say here is props, as always, to Bob Pettit, Aqua Teen's prop and background artist. Uh, these backgrounds, I said that they were pretty nondescript, but they are very well done and very detailed. And I mean... The work speaks for itself. Again, they're using this background uh, in 2022, like 16 years after this episode. So the work speaks for itself. And the hat that Frylock puts on is a throwback to season three, episode seven's Robo Sitter. So in that episode, we had Shake kind of, he had, he had that um that t-shirt cannon. He was shooting t-shirts out with like a logo on it for the Aqua Teens. It was like Shake with a magnifying glass. Um, that is the cap that Frylock is going to put on here. So uh, a reusing of that logo, which is a fun little nod to that episode. We're going to continue directly after that visit because now Frylock is about to get home and Meatwad, Shake, and Carl are throwing him a bit of a surprise party. So he's going to come in and they're going to yell surprise. We have a beautiful banner that says, get well, asshole. <laughs> a bunch of balloons drop. There's like confetti everywhere, all sorts of festivities. And Frylock is not really going to react to this, understandably, given the situation. 
And then that's when Andrew WK comes in. Basically, he's just he's just a guy with white clothes on, but his clothes are a little dirty, and he has long hair. He's going to come in. He's going to kind of kick Frylock and start just shaking his head and singing a beautiful party song for him. He's coming. He's coming. Turn up the light. If we can pay no electric bill. Perfect. <laughs> shh, shh, quiet. Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> Oh God, he looks like he's dead already. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate that. <laughs> I think the problem was the song. You got any other, uh, you know, uh, happier songs about partying? <laughs> So, so much to unpack here in this one scene. Basically, what happens, though, is Frylock, like, he's not amused by this. He just goes right past them, and then he goes straight into his room, and then you hear him slam the door. But they're walking for so long, because they have to play a certain amount of the song, right? They have to, like, extend the scene a bit so that they can keep playing more of the song. So it's funny because they have them walking down this super long hallway to get to Frylock's room. It makes no sense that their hallway would be as long as they show it in this scene. And it's, of course, there's like no other doors until they get to Frylock's room, which I like. I do want to mention above Frylock's like door, you can kind of see like on the ceiling, the entrance to the attic where Willie Nelson would be hanging out, uh, presumably eating some of his corpses up there. But I really want to give props to whoever drew and animated this Andrew WK uh, because he's he's like uh, has the craziest walk cycle as he's going down the hallway. We have Meatwad and Shake kind of dancing. Uh, Carl's walking with them and Frylock, of course, is not having any of this. Uh, let's talk about Andrew WK. I like the way that when he starts singing... Master Shake says, oh, it's Andrew W.K. They have to do that so that the audience knows who the hell this guy even is or who he's supposed to be. And if you don't know, well, I'm in the same boat as you. I only ever knew about Andrew W.K. because of this episode of Aqua Teen. And, like, I'm sure I've seen him once or twice since then, but it's really because of this episode of Aqua Teen I know who Andrew W.K. is. And he is a musician. And the, his shtick kind of is... The majority of his songs are about partying. He has a ton of songs about partying, and this is like a spoof one written by Matt and Dave that he performed for them for this episode. I was super curious how Matt and Dave got Andrew W.K., so Dave Willis had this to say. Dave said, I believe Nick Weidenfeld, one of our development execs, personally knew Andrew. And yes, all of his songs were and are about partying. He made that song specifically for the show. It seemed like a nice juxtaposition to Frylock having cancer. And I agree with Dave here. It, it definitely is. It's kind of a breath of fresh air after all the depressing stuff leading up to this to have this like super out of place craziness with Andrew WK. Party, party, party. I mean, it's really like the most memorable part of the episode. This is like the part that I remember the most outside of Matt's live action stuff was, was this song. And they did go on to re-record this song, and it was included in the, um, the Colin movie film for theaters soundtrack. I don't think it was in the film, but if you buy the CD, it's on there. And I will play the full song version at the end of this podcast, so stick around for that. But yeah, so they just kind of got thrown together with Andrew WK. Uh, they thought it would be a nice juxtaposition. They wrote this silly, simplistic party song. And this is not Andrew W.K.'s uh, first television appearance. He, in 2002, was on Jackass Backyard Barbecue. So he was with those guys on that. After Aqua Teen, he popped up in uh, an episode of American Dad in 2021. But he's done a few other things in between then. His music was used on the Jackass film in 2002. But overall, he is a musician and a successful one at that with all of his songs about partying. I mean, to give you an example, his most recent record that came out in 2021 is called God is Partying. So you get the idea of what Andrew W.K. likes. I mean, the, the album cover for that new one is him passed out with uh, what's supposed to be piss uh, on his crotch. Like, that's the whole shtick. And it's done beautifully here. So I, I think it's great that he would come on to Aqua Teen, um, where they're kind of like, 
mocking him in a way, but I th- like he's in on the joke. I don't think that he sincerely is writing these songs about partying. Like, that's the shtick. In my email with Matt, Matt actually said that he played the lead on the Party Party song. Matt says, I think I used my Ibanez RG for that and ran it through a Sansamp directly into Pro Tools at the studio. I used a Mesa patch on the Sansamp. There's some uh, gear talk for the guitar heads here. So again, uh, Matt and Dave wrote this song. They're credited on writing the Party Party song uh, in the credits, and Andrew WK just performed it, I guess. Although I don't know who did all of the music here. But we know that is Matt on the lead guitar, at least. Really quickly, uh, to some visuals in this scene, I do want to say we get a nice balloon drop when Frylock walks in, and these balloons are ones that we've seen in the show before. In fact, I know we've seen them in Season 2, Episode 16's Brood Witch, like when Shake uh, wins like his bride, <laughs> and the, like, like the balloons drop down. It's the same exact effect here. Uh, we see, like, Boxy Brown is here, uh, as well as Dewey and Vanessa, Meatwad's dolls, and they're wearing hats alongside Shake, Meatwad, and Carl. These are the same party hats that we saw in Season 2, Episode 14, Spirit Journey Formation Anniversary, uh, when it's Meatwad's birthday at the beginning of that episode. Uh, it's the same party hats there. And then there's a fun little drawing on the wall that Meatwad did. It's it's I don't know what it's supposed to be. I don't know if it's supposed to be him, but it's like a circle with with uh, eyes and a little smile, and then little, I don't know if those are supposed to be ears or Meatwad's hands coming off of the ball character. And then it says, from Meatwad. So, nice little drawing there for Frylock, I guess. And then, of course, there are some other balloons in the scene, too, and these are ones that we've seen in previous episodes as well. There's also a cute little bear on the wall with a heart that it's holding, kind of like a get well soon kind of bear. But Frylock wasn't having any of this, and I think it's sweet that the guys were trying to do something for him, but he doesn't want anything to do with it, so you heard, he goes to his room, he slams the door, it's nighttime now, we cut in, we see Frylock laying down in his bed, it's nighttime, like I said, the lights are off, until the same group of characters, we have Shake, Meatwad Carl, and Andrew WK, they burst into Frylock's room, turn the lights on, and they start trying to get the party going again. Look, my doctor says I need to get as much rest as possible, okay? Yeah, hey, get the fun out of here! <laughs> and I am now leaving as well. <laughs> so we get that shot of Frylock's wall that the door is on, which we don't see a lot, but we have seen it before. And I love that the the color of that wall is different than the color of the <laughs> other walls in the room. But a little detail that I loved, and I think probably is just attributed to the show being done as cheaply as it was, is that when Andrew WK is walking out of the room, he's doing like his crazy like singing party walk. Like he's like shaking his hair, which makes sense when he's performing the song, but... As he leaves the room, he's not singing, but he's still like going crazy as he leaves the room, which is hilarious. And I do want to mention when Carl dances, he's, he's doing some cool finger guns. So Carl, he's packing some moves as well. That's it for Andrew WK, though. He's, he's gone from the episode. So yeah, he doesn't actually say anything. He just performs the song and, and shows up uh, as himself, I guess, in the episode. So we're going to go out to the hallway now because in that last clip... Uh, everyone left, and then Shake kind of came back in the room to close the door for Frylock. So we have Carl, Meatwad, and Shake in the hallway discussing what is going on. What are, what are we gonna do if what if Frylock dies? Don't say that! Don't you ever say that! Don't you understand? He's in this all by himself. He needs for us to be strong for him, and we need him to know that we're gonna be right by his side through this till the end. I just don't know what I would do. Now come here. He'll be fine. He's gonna be fine. He always did so much for me. I, I can't be here right now. Wait, I have an idea. Shake has an idea, but before then, let's discuss that last clip. 
very heartfelt. We actually have Meatwad, Shake, and Carl just doing like a group hug, which is a, a big change of pace for Carl. You know, you'll think back to season three, episode one's video Ouija, where uh, you know Carl, he's not, he's not, he he doesn't play that way. You know what I'm saying? But uh, in this scene, he's willing to put that aside and hug these guys because of the emotional situation that they are in. And something that this episode is really doing is showing how important Frylock is as a character, which, I mean, I'll say it, Frylock typically is the least popular character on the show because he's really just used as a straight man. But we have the characters here afraid because, you know, in, in their universe, if he were to die, then they would all be screwed because he's the one making sure that they're all okay. But in terms of the show, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, if there was no Frylock, then there's no logic really to the show, and then it would just go down the drain in, in Dada crazy land. But interestingly, this is actually Carrie Means' least favorite episode of the show, Carrie Means being Frylock's voice actor. He thought when he got the script that they were trying to write Frylock off the show or something like that, which of course is not the case, and that's not what Matt and Dave intended at all. But I, I could see why Carrie would not like this episode that much, because, you know, it's just his, his character dying basically the whole time. But it's important, too, to note why they picked Frylock for this, and it's because Frylock is really the only character, in my opinion, that works for this kind of episode. Like, if it were Shake that was dying, do you really think the other characters would be this sad? I mean, there's many episodes where <laughs> Meatwad is glad that, like, Shake is dead or, or that he's out of town or, or whatever. Uh, of course, I, I'm referencing Video Ouija and Season 2, Episode 5, Supermodel. Like, Meatwad's usually happy when Shake's not around, so Shake doesn't work. I think Meatwad could work for this as well, but Frylock, you know, he's really the best one for these story-driven episodes, and I mean, look at both Aqua Teen films, colon movie film for theater and Plantasm. Both of those are kind of like revolving around Frylock because he's the only character that can kind of pull like big grand films like that off. And it's the same thing here in an episode like this or or even uh, like Christian's favorite episode, The, where, yeah, it's like Frylock has to be the one to leave to get his own apartment because the other characters couldn't do that. So whenever Matt and Dave are having to do a story centric episode or a film, they're kind of reaching for Frylock for that. And I think the reason they wouldn't do this for Meatwad is it would just be too goddamn sad because he's like basically a little kid. So that would be even worse. But all right, Shake's got an idea. Let's jump and see what this idea is. I think it's going to be a good one. Gentlemen, we have a time machine. And this is the key to Frylock's health. We can break it apart, light it on fire, and smoke the cancer out. <laughs> well, don't smoke a lot cause cancer. That has never been proven. Do whatever the hell you want. I don't care. Frylock, you, you come back. I must cure you! <laughs> Damn it. So that, uh, a very great quick cut. That is the house completely burned down. I don't have to tell you which flames they are using to burn the house down. Ooh, Frylock is laying literally in the street at this point. They're just sitting around while the house is burnt to a crisp. So this is really like the only quick cut in the episode, like a comedic quick cut especially to like reveal a joke in this way because again most of this episode is very slow and slow paced. I love that the idea wasn't to just go back in time before Frylock had cancer or something like that, you know what I mean? But uh of course that would just kind of solve the episode and we still have a bit more of the episode to go, so they can't just end it there. So the Aqua Teens are outside of their burning house. Frylock can't be outside and eventually he's just going to get up and go on over to Carl's house. Guys, <clears throat> I'm not supposed to be out in the sun. I know, buddy, but, uh, we'll... I could... I mean, I could blow up the sun. <laughs> That's it! I will blow up the sun! <laughs> Where are you going? That's Frylock slamming Carl's door. Even though Shake is a moron, it is sweet. Like, he is, I think, genuinely trying to help Frylock here, which is not something we see in most episodes, and I think uh, it, it attributes to the different nature of this episode, particularly with not only the, the sadness of it and, and the slow pace, the silence, but also the fact that the characters are trying to help Frylock, especially Shake, 
in a way that he typically doesn't. And then going into our next clip now, we're going to have Frylock laying on Carl's couch. Carl's going to be there, and uh, he's going to be wearing a bit of a makeshift medical getup. He's going to be wearing blue latex gloves, a blue mask, as in like a surgical mask. And then <laughs> my favorite piece of this outfit is he basically took a black garbage bag and then fit it over his body. So this, you know, he's trying to protect himself from Frylock's cancer, even though obviously cancer is not transmissible. I really appreciate you letting me stay here for a while, Carl. Yeah, no problem. Anything, really. When, uh, how long did they, did they say you had? <clears throat> they don't know. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to meet with my doctor today. Sometime this month, you think, or, uh... I don't know, Carl. Probably, so definitely probably not this week. Just ballpark it for me. I don't you know. <laughs> You're not like, uh... <laughs> Wiping cancer are all over my couch, right? You know, you really don't have to wear that. I know that. I figure, you know, I got house guests, so, uh, good idea to keep the pants on. Don't want to embarrass you. Because I got that big uh, baby arm clutching an <laughs> apple. <laughs> Hanging low. <laughs> keep off the sausage. <laughs> okay. Comedy doesn't work today. I should say visually Frylock is looking very gaunt here. His box isn't as bright as it normally is. And even during that scene, we see like one of his fries fall off as in, you know, obviously, again, that's mirroring somebody on chemotherapy losing their hair. And I, I want to point out uh, in the previous scene when Frylock was laying in the street, it was kind of cool because what was left of his fries were all kind of to one side, like the side that he was laying on. So it looked cool. And then here the fries are being back to spread out. So they're paying attention to like how they work with these fries in his box in a way that they typically don't have to. Something I want to point out, though, is I think that we just got an Aqua Teen first, which is I think that's the first time that Frylock ever goes to stay with Carl because Shake does in season two, episode eight, Super Squatter, when he doesn't pay any of the bills, he just goes over to Carl's house. And then Meatwad does in Season 2, Episode 15's The Shaving. I mean, in Meatwad's words, he's just visiting. But, you know, Meatwad's hanging out at Carl's house for a lot of that episode. And then now in this one, we have Frylock hanging out here uh, without the other Aqua Teens. So that's what I mean, like the Aqua Teens individually staying at, at Carl's house for some period of time. But Frylock's about to get moving here because he has to go see his doctor. So he's going to be outside in front of Carl's house. And right in Carl's driveway, we have a rocket, and Shake is duct taped to it, and he's trying to follow through on a previous promise. He's going to go up to the sun and blow it up so that Frylock... <laughs> so, <laughs> so then Frylock can go outside, and it'll be okay, because, you know, he's got this skin cancer, and it'll be fine now. There's, there'll, there'll be no sun. That won't cause any problems. Unfortunately, though, for Shake, and fortunately for us, this goes about as well as you would expect. Hey, time to destroy the sun right now, buddy, and it's all for you, baby. Right on forever. Light it up, me wad. Carl Dunham, like five minutes ago. Right, I need my goggles. But I need my UV ray goggles. So it explodes. I, I want to mention on the rocket, we have a bow that goes flying. And also you see one of Shake's hands go flying off. And yeah, just a huge explosion. To the rocket, there's a lot of art on it. There's a lot of writing on it. They have their mission statement clearly defined. And some of the phrases I could make out that are written here include Burn in hell, son. Die, son, die. From Meatwad. <laughs> this is for Frylock. And we love Frylock. At the very top of the missile, there is a bunch of writing, but we never get a close-up of it, so I can't make out what that says. But being taped to a rocket that explodes is not new for Aqua Teen. In both of the season two episodes, Frat Aliens and the last one, we see DP uh, explode on a rocket in this exact way. And then in the last one, we see the leprechauns and the trees. Uh, the same thing happens to them in a way. So <laughs> a character exploding on a rocket, not anything new for us Aqua Teen fans, but it's always delightful when it happens. And this is the third time in the episode that Shake really should have died. And that is, I think, a smart and brilliant part of this episode. 
because the entire episode is about Frylock dying in this very serious way. But also in this episode, we see Shake, you know, get a billion bee stings and then fall off a ladder and be fine. He eats a scorpion and chokes on it and like passes out and he's completely fine. And here he gets exploded in a rocket and we don't see him for the rest of the episode, but you assume he's fine, right? That's what happens in Aqua Teen is particularly Shake and Carl get killed over and over again and they're fine, and in this case, it happens multiple times in one episode, and they just keep coming back, right? It's Aqua Teen. That's, that's the norm. But Frylock has cancer in this episode, and it's treated very seriously, despite the fact that Shake is dying over and over again and coming back. We cut to the doctor's office again, and immediately we could see Frylock looks normal. He looks healthy, he looks like he does in every other episode, He's talking to the doctor, but something seems a little awry, and then we really see that things are strange when a monster will burst through the door at the end of this clip. Well, uh, we got your blood work back. And? No, uh, no apparent trace of cancer in the lymph nodes. Oh, God, thank you. You have no idea how great that is to hear. But, uh, listen. Aliens. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, the aliens are coming. For us, you and I, that's why we must merge as one together to defeat them and their lasers. <laughs> so that is a monster flying in and grabbing the doctor and flying off. It's shooting lasers out of its eyes. And this monster is actually really cool because it's a bit of an amalgamation of other monsters we've seen in the show. So to start, it has the Universal Remonster's head, of course, from Season 2, Episode 11's Universal Remonster. It has Willie Nelson's body from The Shaving, and then it has Moth Monster Man's wings from Season 1, Episode 3's Bus of the Undead. So, pretty cool here. And also, it has different eyes. I'm not sure if those eyes are from a monster that I'm not quite picking out. But, yeah, it's like a mishmash of other monsters we've seen on the show, which is great. It just picks up the Doctor and flies away. However... As you could imagine, this is all just a bit of a dream. Like, Frylock fell asleep in the doctor's office. We cut now to him still in the doctor's office, but again, he's looking sick like he he has throughout most of this episode, and he has a much more normal conversation with the doctor. Hello? Mr. Locke? Well, uh, we got your blood work back. And? No, uh, No apparent trace of cancer in the lymph nodes. Oh, God. Thank you. You have no idea how great that is to but, hear. But, uh, listen. I want you to stay out of the sun, plenty of rest, and, uh, I want you to schedule another visit for you in two months. All right. No problem. Yeah. We're not out of the woods yet. All right, then. And that is the end of the episode. That is party all the time. And I like the way that the doctor refers to Frylock as Mr. Locke. Uh, Jump ahead to 2022 in Aqua Teen Forever Plantasm. They say that Frylock's name is Franklin French Frylock. But uh, here they just call him Mr. Locke. And I really like the way that that uh, initial visit to the doctor's office, like the, the dream sequence, was all crazy. And then this one was mirroring that, like, the doctor said a lot of the same stuff, but then it was a lot more mundane, because he's like, listen, need you to stay out of the sun. (laughs) Like, you know, you're expecting it to be similar to the previous clip before that, where he's like, listen, you know, aliens, all this crazy shit. But this, a lot more grounded. And the episode, I mean, it has a happy ending. Frylock seems to be in the clear, like, there's no trace of cancer. Now, we can see he still has a bunch of shit on his face. I'm surprised they didn't cut that off or anything like that. But I guess they will uh, now at this point, I would hope at least. But luckily, Frylock is okay. And I've got, you know, some thoughts on on this whole episode. Before I give you my thoughts, let's jump on over to the Toon Zone forum and talk about the discussion that was happening the very night that this episode premiered. And the first two comments here are negative. We have Discloner saying, Loved the dick episode, liked the dog rape episode, Hated this one. It was more creepy and depressing than funny. And then right after Discloner, USS Manhattan comes in saying, Yeah, this is the first ATHF that has fallen completely flat for me. A real disappointment. 
I guess actually uh, we're three for three here because coming in after that, we have Sketch saying horrible. The highlights were Shake doing stupid things. So those are the first three like real comments on this. Uh, luckily, the fourth person kind of liked it, though. But a lot of people really didn't enjoy this one. But the people that did really seemed to like it. User The Mist said... It got really sad around the seven minute mark when Shake gave his speech about holding together for Frylock. It's like, damn, this is sad. I mean, legitimately sad, not like, this is so unfunny, it's sad. Legitimately depressing. Then they came back with Shake doing more stupid things and Carl's precautions and the aliens thing, but it was still pretty depressing. I liked the episode. I got a lot of laughs. I started laughing out loud when Frylock said, I have cancer and I'm going to hell for it. But it was also pretty sad, though. I saw a comparison to Moral Oral earlier in the episode. The difference I see is that Oral's been depressing and dark from the start. In Aqua Teen Hunger Force, it's always been pretty fun and weird. So in this episode, it got serious and sad, and I don't know. It's like, I actually care about Frylock while I don't care at all about Oral. So seeing Frylock dying like this was a lot more emotional than Oral getting beaten by his dad. Spoilers. So I like what the Mist had to say here. And then user jbanks97 comes in with, I have to admit, I loved this one. The whole concept of taking a death seriously on this show while all the random insanity happened in the background. I kept waiting for the turn off the VR simulator moment to happen and for them to admit it was a farce, but it never came. I thought the ending with the lasers and random doctor nonsense was it, but that ended up being a dream. Maybe you have to experience it to fully appreciate it. Jay Banks then goes on to talk a bit about Andrew WK. It seems like they are a fan of his. So I just want to read some of these like negative and positive ones. There's more negative ones than positive, but over it's not like the episode was hated. Again, the people that liked it seem to really enjoy it. And as per usual, check the description. I'll put a link to this thread if you want to read all these comments. I would suggest it because when an episode is this divisive, that's when I find the comments uh, the most interesting. But on to my thoughts on this one, right? So I had seen this one around the time it came out. And really, the, like I said, the only things I remembered was Frylock was dying, that Andrew WK did a very inappropriate song in terms of just the timing was inappropriate. And then there was the Matt Malero music part. And those were the only thing, three things I remembered. On watching this back, I was actually surprised how serious and dramatic it was. I don't remember it being this depressing, and, of course, that is by design. This episode being depressing is the point. That's what Matt and Dave were going for. For example, Boost Mobile, the point was to be an ad-infested commercial. The point of Dickisode was to be very vulgar and see what they could get through standards and practices, and maybe similarly with Hand Banana. And then the point of this one was to go for this dark kind of anti-comedy and actually, I don't even want to say that because let's go back to my email with Dave. And this is the part that I found the most interesting that I've been saving until now. This is what Dave said to me in the email. I only wish we would have been deadly serious for the entire episode. Zero jokes. But we chickened out and got goofy at the end. So this is a big insight. Like they wanted this to just be like a straight up drama but in Dave's words, they chickened out, so they added some kind of humor and, and, and goofiness to this. And I find that so interesting, and that really is on trend for what has been happening this season with Matt and Dave doing a lot of different kind of episodes that we've never gotten from Aqua Teen before. And I do want to say, uh, there's one episode coming up that is different that is trying to play on a TV trope, but otherwise the rest of this season is pretty standard for Aqua Teen. So it's not like the rest of the season they're trying to do these kinds of things, these kinds of different things. That's not the case. This is kind of like the last big episode that tries to be very different. But yeah, I was fascinated by that because I kind of got that impression from watching this before Dave said that to me was that it seemed like the episode didn't really know what it was trying to do, because on one hand, it's very serious, but then they do have these little comedy moments that I was like, okay, is it trying to be funny, or is it trying to be serious? And it seems like Matt and Dave themselves didn't entirely know, or they at least didn't entirely commit to this being a full-fledged drama episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. So, 
as a viewer of this episode, I was not crazy about it. And, you know, there again, there are some great moments. Again, the Matt Malero thing at the beginning, like I said, is it's honestly one of my favorite Aqua Teen jokes ever. Uh, the party song is iconic. There are some really great moments in this episode. You know, I like the quick cut of of Shake. Like, he wants to smoke the cancer out, but he ends up burning the house down. Like, that quick cut hits pretty hard because there aren't that many quick funny cuts in this episode. So there are some great moments here. But, like, we're not tuning into Aqua Teen for a drama. However, knowing that they were purposely doing that, especially... You know, on this podcast, we really try and pay attention to what Matt and Dave's intentions were. That makes me appreciate the episode a lot more than I, I would as just a viewer. So that makes this a, a difficult episode for me to really judge and talk about. Because again, like, the viewer in me isn't crazy about it compared to other Aqua Teen episodes because it's so different. But as somebody who appreciates this show as like, you know, I guess, for, for lack of a better term, like like, appreciates it for the art form of the show, I really like creatively that they tried to do, like, a dramatic episode of the show. So I think because of that, I'm going to give this one, like, three scorpions out of five. Like, it's just, like, it's so different, it's hard to judge this one. But something else I like about this one, too, though, is that it is saved by these music moments. It's saved by Matt Malero being silly at the beginning. It's saved by Andrew W.K. being silly towards the end of the episode. Music kind of saves this one from being purely bleak. Although, maybe if it was purely bleak, I would appreciate that more. I don't know. It's it, it's hard to tell, but it's a very unique episode of the show. Party all the time. And for better or for worse, I think it's a, a very somewhat iconic episode. A, a notorious episode of the show because of that. It's definitely a divisive episode. And I'm glad we got to go through it. I mean, it's a depressing episode, so it is what it is. But uh, I enjoyed watching through it, and I hope that you enjoyed hanging out and talking about it with me. So that is it for me this week. Again, thanks for hanging out, talking teens with me. Thank you to Christian and PJ for signing up to the Patreon. Again, that is patreon.com slash dancing is forbidden. If you want to support this show, I love doing it, and I'd like to keep doing it. Otherwise, if you're unable to support the show financially, but still want to help out, just telling one person about the podcast, it helps a lot. So of course, you know, I gotta thank our Highlander, Nick. There can be only one! There's only one time in Aqua Teen so far where Frylock goes to stay with Carl, just like there's only one Nick. And of course, shout outs to our number one in the Hood G tier patrons, Sean, Ian, Captain Buford, Robison, Jason, Carl, Leche Raton, 69, Empower 706, Swimwiki, Carson, Lurvenator, Tegan, and Thorin the Grumpy Dwarf. You guys can try and blow up the sun any day of the week. I'll see you next week, but until then, keep it cool, take it easy, bye bye. Thank you.